I'm just calling this change has come. Hoping actually that those words are words for us, because I think we all, in a variety of ways and capacities, are looking for change. And we're waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And I don't know that we could really think like the, uh, the Jews did on Palm Sunday. I mean, we're all looking forward to the second coming. But to be honest with you, I mean, there may be somebody in this room who you say on a daily basis, I'm like looking and my heart is beating fast because I can't wait. You know, I'm just, it's on my mind all the time. I kind of doubt it, but maybe it is. So don't let me be, uh, I know it's not on mine like that. But for the Jews looking forward to the coming of their Messiah for thousands of years, they were much more intense than we are about the second coming really looking and looking and waiting from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation and he didn't come and all of a sudden they have Palm Sunday which obviously they didn't call Palm Sunday but it was the arrival of Messiah that's what they perceived it as that's what they were so it's like all of a sudden wherever whatever you were what you were doing it has kind of like that second come none of that really matters anymore because Things are going to be different now. Messiah has come. Things are going to be different. That's kind of what was in my heart all along. That's really the bottom line of this thing. But there were songs that were sung in the streets based on Old Testament prophecies and stuff like that. And it's interesting. We're going to look at all four Gospels, just a couple of verses in each one, of what each writer says they were singing in the streets. Okay, so Mark chapter 11... Verses 9 and 10. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Luke chapter 19, verses 37 and 38. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. John chapter 12, verses 13, 14, and 15. Took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. You'd almost think they were in four different parades. I mean, by what they're recording... They all record, there's, there's like the similarities through there, but there's definitely distinct differences. And that's okay. Because my guess is when we leave here today, if somebody said, you know, what did Steve say when we first started? We'd have at least four different, you know, things that were said. Does it make a difference? No, because what we're always striving for, especially with the Word of God, is not necessarily specifically this exact word, but what is the Spirit saying? Because we know that, you know, you're not going to get every single word. What is the Spirit saying behind it? So when you look at these four, the gospel things there, I wouldn't expect you guys to jump on this right away unless you've studied it. They're quoting Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm. They're quoting Zechariah 9, Isaiah 56, Jeremiah 7, plus more that's not in the Old Testament. Like in John, what Russ read it, he, John puts fear not before the Zechariah 9 prophecy, and it never says anything about fearing. John throws it in there, fear not. But he puts it almost in the context, like he's quoting Zechariah 9. You go to Zechariah 9, which is where we are going today, and there's nothing in there about fear not. So it gets kind of interesting. Unless you think of it this way, and we probably know people, I hope there's nobody in the room like this, but we probably, you may know some people. He said, Jesus is coming, and they practically hide not realizing, wait a minute, Jesus is coming. This is really, really good. 
Yeah, but uh, no, no, Jesus is coming. This is really, really good. Yeah, but uh, no, no, Jesus is coming. You see, they had the same kind of thing with Messiah. Messiah is coming. Great. Oh, wait a minute. Not so great. I've, you know, some of the things I've been doing. And John is saying, relax, fear not. Don't be afraid. You have any idea what he's got in store for you? What he's going to do to restore your relationship to the Father? He's not asking you to do anything. He's going to do it all. Don't be afraid. See, John picks up on something that um, I just absolutely love because he has this tremendous revelation. He knows love. He knows love, and nobody is going to change his mind about anything when it comes to, well, you know, our God is a God. Of, yeah, we're fine. Great. Have a field day. You know, go do what you got to do. I'm telling you, he loves you. And he's about to go to the cross to reveal the greatest love that's ever been known. If you need any more than that, I don't know what else to tell you. I just don't know what to say, except fear not. There's no real reason to fear here. So we're going to go to Zechariah 9, because both Matthew and John, they grab hold of the Zechariah 9 prophecy, which is a great prophecy. And that's where I want to go today, is to Zechariah 9, getting a hold of Matthew and John. Mark and Luke do not say anything about the daughter of Zion or anything like that. Matthew and John both pick up on that, and obviously people in the streets were singing and shouting the prophecy from Zechariah 9. This is just one of the songs that was being sung in the streets. Verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on an ass, and upon the colt of a foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from river even to the ends of the earth. Well. For thee also, by the blood of your covenant, I have sent forth your prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope, even today do I declare that I will re render double unto thee. Tricky little thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, don't feel bad if you're not quite getting it all, because the Jews didn't either. <laughs> if they really got what is being said there, it's like today is your lucky day. Not only are you going to get what you thought you were going to get, you are going to get a double portion. And he's bringing salvation to you. You don't have to work for that thing. He's going to give it to you. You know, the whole, it's, it's such a tremendous prophecy. And he's saying, I know you felt like you've been in a waterless pit, which doesn't mean a lot to us. It's kind of like, well, if you're in a pit, you climb out or whatever. It's had a different connotation to the Jews, what a waterless pit was. That's a nasty place to be, to be at the bottom of a hole where there's nothing but darkness and trying to keep hopeful about somehow getting out of there. Is somebody going to come by and get me out or what? Because I can't get out of this. I'm done. I have got no hope. And he's saying, oh, yes, you do. You just don't know it. And hope has arrived. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. And you can't miss, you know, your king is coming to you on the foal. And the, I mean, it's, it's the prophecy that they're singing in the streets. They recognize Zechariah 9 is happening. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I was talking with somebody who's their Bible study recently. They were studying Daniel's 70 weeks. And if you've ever studied that from Daniel chapter 9 or you know about it, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prophesies over 400 years before Palm Sunday when it was going to take place. So it's kind of funny. You know, when I looked at this, I was thinking, nobody says anything about Daniel. They obviously didn't, they hadn't put that prophecy quite together the way the way we have and stuff but they obviously were in tune to Zechariah they recognized oh my goodness this is Zechariah 9 our king is coming to us I wanted to do something here before we go any further the word hope which is what's really on my heart today think of a sentence and just use the word hope this is not a test it's just a, a sentence that uses the word hope Hope is an interesting okay. word. Number one, it's a noun. And number two, it's a verb. You can go either way. Mm -hmm. You can use it as I hope this, I hope that. Or like you said, you know, there's always hope or whatever. 
It's an interesting kind of word, and the, the, the phrase that's used in Zechariah, actually, um, the thing that's being said here really is, though they've experienced affliction, and some are still in affliction, they're holding on to hope. The Hebrew word hope is the same word they use for a cord. You know, he, Hebrew is a very pictorial language. So I wrote down here the rope of hope. They're holding on to the rope of hope. Yeah. Hope on a rope, that's right. <laughs> it has a little bit more of a connotation to it. It represents uh, the thing longed for, expectation, desire, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you remember in Joshua 2, Rahab the harlot? And she helps them out. And in return, they're going to make sure that she doesn't get destroyed in Jericho. And they said, all you have to do is drop the scarlet cord down so everybody who's coming into Jericho, when they see the cord, when she lets down her robe of hope, they'll see it. And when they see that, you'll be safe. It's the same, the same word, tikva, is the word. It's, I like that word, tikva. Um, I want to do a little illustration, though. And I think I'll uh, let Russ be the one to help me with this, OK? Just go out into the hallway. And I don't know whose bag that is holding. So you see it ending at the door? Right now, I just see the door. Well, what's at the other end of the road? Oh, it would be Russ. You sure? You're believing that it's Russ because you saw him at, when the door is closed, you saw him with him. <clears throat> but the truth is, it could be anything. He could have tied it around a chair out there. Mm -hmm. It could be any place. But there is something at the other end. And even when we say there is something at the other end, the truth is that we believe there's something at the other yes. end. But we really don't know. And that's the nature of hope. Hope is I'm holding on to something, and I believe faith is the substance of things hoped for. Mm. It's all I've got. It's the evidence of what I don't see. But I've got hope. I know I've got hope. His name is Jesus. And God identified himself as our hope. But we don't see it. Problem with Palm Sunday and the beauty of Palm Sunday. The Jews are holding on to this rope for thousands of years, and they think they got one thing at the other end. And when he doesn't come in and blow the place apart with his army and deliver them from Rome, all of a sudden they realize what they thought they had, they don't have. And they can't begin to comprehend what they do have. And that turns into a nasty scene over the course of a week. By the time the week's over, they're crucifying him because you weren't what I believed you were. And our God is saying, I know, I'm better. I'm much better. You see, while you're thinking about being delivered from the Romans, you know what the real problem is? You're afraid. How would you like to have confidence, no matter if there's Romans or not? Who gives a rip about Romans? I came to deliver you from fear. I came to deliver you from lies. I came to deliver you from shame and things like that. That's what we've got. While you're thinking about who's occupying our country, the only reason you're concerned about is that because you're afraid. Let me take care of the fear. Fear not. Thanks, Russ.